But yeah, man, so you're doing the, the standing desk. I'm just curious because I, I have the, the sit stand one where it's motorized. You can move it up and down. But I can't, I, I like it, but I can't stand at it for more than maybe an hour to a day without getting pretty uncomfortable. Yes. How long do you stand all day? I stand most of the day. It took me a while to to segue over when I have, there's this thing on the ground that's basically like this rubber mat that has texture on it so that I can move on it. So I'm actually moving around. If I'm just standing, I'm on these hardwood floors. If I stand on them directly, it can be uncomfortable. But if I'm actually like moving around and stretching my calves, I can stay here for a long time. And somehow I feel more active. Like I'm I'm ready to attack the Ableton <laughs> session. I know what you mean, man. I mean, anytime, anytime I'm working on a session and I get stuck in a loop where I'm just listening to the same thing over and over, or I don't know what the next step is. Yeah, standing up and just working that way, it does give you this weird new influx of energy. It does. Yeah, it really does. And I found that, especially for doing super long sessions, that... um if you're sitting, you're actually actively doing a little bit of damage <laughs> all, all day. But I don't think you need to stand the entire time. But I think it's best to be um, moving back and forth or sitting and standing. But um, yeah, I think I just I really like the fact that I'm getting a little workout. Yeah, it's great. Oh, I mean, it's way better for your health. I, I think, oh, yeah. you know, we see more and more all these studies about how terrible sitting for long periods of time is for our bodies. And uh, I mean, yeah, I think... The, this is true for plenty of industries. I mean, anyone who works with computers is the same way. But, uh, you know, for for musicians, electronic musicians, we really kind of hit all the, the checklist of all the worst things, right? Because it's sitting for long periods of time. It's no sleep. It's uh, tons of rough travel. Yes. All of those kinds of things. And then as you get older, if you're lucky enough to have a long career, your body just deteriorates and deals with it worse and worse. <laughs> yes. I mean, that's been the thing this, this year, well, last year, 2020, I mean, we had a big tour planned and we're going to continue, we were going to continue the hamster wheel of touring and stopping has allowed me to get really healthy and focus on, on that sort of stuff, which has been really fun fringe benefit of having a tour be canceled, which has all sorts of other implications. I'm sure that you had the same experience, but when you're constantly coming and going and traveling, you don't really have the ability to set up a routine and really exercise and do or do whatever it is that's meaningful to you. So it's been it, that has been the, uh, the benefit of this past year for me. Oh, absolutely, man. I mean, I tend to think of you as a pretty health conscious kind of person, somebody who tries to take care of themselves. Were you even, you know, even for this last tour, this last cycle, were you in some habits that were not so good? Like, what did you change over the last year? Um, I've been pretty healthy, I would say, on the spectrum of just complete party mode into a health junkie. Over time, I've gotten more and more healthy. And Glitch Mob in general were all the people on tour where we would go out and find healthy food to eat, eat organic uh, for the most part. Although we also still have fun a little bit, but we're very health conscious. And um, so for me, it was really the the sleep deprivation that came along with touring and, and pretty much living on the bus. Um, I sleep really well in general. I'm blessed to not have insomnia or any anything that really interrupts yeah, my sleep. I'm, I'm the same, yeah. Um, and some people sleep really well on buses. But for me, it it was it turned into um, pretty serious sleep deprivation, and it would take me like a month to recover. I mean, I love being on the bus. I love the camaraderie of it. I love waking up in some new city and getting to walk around and explore. I mean, it's, I'm really grateful to have had so many adventures uh, around the world. But the hopping time zones and everything, ultimately. I feel like there's a a cascade of decisions where if I'm sleep deprived, I'm drinking more coffee, waking up later, and all yeah. these things where you know, it's it's this whole snowball effect. So for me, stopping all of that and really taking the time to form new habits that whenever touring happens again, uh, we'll be able to really protect those. 
Yeah, I, that's so important, man. And a lot of people I've talked to on the show over the last year have said something similar to that. I really do hope, it, I mean, because when, I, I'm sure you remember, like when all of this started, you know, almost a, a year ago now, and everybody was pulled off the road at the same time, I think for those first couple months, you know, people were talking about, oh, every this is going to change everything. When shows come back, you know, everything's going to be different. People are going to experiment with their music and we're all going to change our lifestyles. And I don't know, I hope that happens, but I feel like some of that energy has maybe waned as people have gotten more and more tired. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it, it, it's going to be so fascinating to see what happens when live shows can can come on in a real capacity and i and i don't really count the drive-in shows or the bubble shows but i mean actually in a concert venue with a couple hundred people i mean i you know like ultras ha was just happening in in uh in taiwan it's fully online there. yeah <laughs> uh it it looks um it's so crazy to actually see that happening so it, it'll be really interesting to see i mean i am excited to see if there will be smaller shows happening under plays because at first, I mean, who knows what's going to happen, but I imagine at first some of the venues will have, will not uh, allow in thousands of people that there'll be smaller shows. So yeah. that was always an exciting thing for me to think that there would be a reason to have a really big venue with uh, tables spread apart and um, kind of get back to what it's like to play to a really intimate crowd because there's an energy there that you can't get with uh, with really massive festival stages. Yeah, it's true, man. And I think the the touring landscape, at least at first, is probably going to be so crowded, right? Because everybody's going to try to get in as soon as they can. You know, everybody is trying to book their tours on top of each other. And I feel like, I hope, this is my hope I'm putting out into the world, is that, you know, there is a bit more of that underground energy that comes to fill in the the desire for it, right? Because if all of the the main venues are going to be taken by the biggest names for the first, you know, six months or so, I, I hope we find more alternative venues, underground spaces, creative ideas for, you know, different ways to put on shows so that everyone can kind of get in there. And then hopefully the crowds can get all these different kinds of experiences. Yeah, absolutely. And I think there's one of the huge benefits of live streaming that I've seen in myself um, and all my various projects within Glitch Mob and Friends is that people feel the freedom to experiment with new sounds and new visual setups because you don't have to simply just rock the crowd. And I think that there's this new strand of uh, experimentation that has come in. And I've had so many conversations with people about how they feel liberated during their live stream sets. And I, and I, do, th I do think that that will come back into the way that people play and perform and even create music because um, right now, I mean, if you think about David Byrne talks about this in his book and um, you might, you and I might've spoken about this on the, the, the first podcast, but how music exists in a relationship or a conversation with the venue in which it's performed, right? It's not, it does not exist in a bubble. Right. And um, that place that at least as far as let's say, dance music, it's dance music that's meant for big stages, that place does not exist. So it's strange to me. I mean, we're working on a new Glitch Mob uh, record right now. We just started the process. And it's fascinating to, to feel... Um, so when we wrote See Without Eyes in 2017, just thinking about the process of writing music for the Blade and for our, for our stage or thinking about the festivals that we would be playing. And not even, it doesn't have to even be a conscious decision of like, this is going to sound good here, but I, but it's, it's baked into the whole process and right now. <laughs> yeah. I don't, yeah. I don't have that. So creatively, I think it's really good to shake things up and jostle the snow globe around. So I think there's going to be some really good music that's going to come out uh, of this whole process. I hope so, man. And that's awesome to hear that you guys are working on another record right now, because I, when I think about glitch mob music, I mean, obviously you guys do huge shows and you have the blade, uh, which is your, your stage setup that's, you know, visually impressive. People can watch you perform, you know, it's like a physical performance. There's all these different components to it. But when I think about your actual music, you know, it could fit in a lot of different categories. And it's interesting to think about, you know, you guys sitting down and trying to make music, not so much thinking about how it's going to be presented after the fact, right? Yeah. 
Like, is that, was that a conscious mind shift or, or are you finding it to be that? Like when you guys get together and write music for this new album, are you consciously trying to push out those thoughts of, you know, how are we eventually going to present this? Or is it more just kind of being in this quieter moment, this more calm moment and just whatever happens is kind of a result of how you're feeling? Yeah, I think it's more of the latter in the sense that uh, the musical process is good for embracing the the unknown. And I think that having some uncertainty and mystery makes really good music. And right now, we can all say that like, well, maybe we'll be touring in fall. Maybe we'll be touring in... Uh, the, no one actually knows. Anyone yeah. that says that to you with any certainty is wrong. The only thing I know for certain, <laughs> for sure, is that there's no certainty yeah. around any of this. Um, and, and, and there's something about making music from that standpoint that I think is really inspiring. Although we're not physically writing together, we're writing remotely now for the first time. We had a studio in Highland Park, Los Angeles, that we actually gave up because mm. um, we had written a lot of Sea Without Eyes there, um, but we just felt like it wasn't the right time and we were going to really do the social distancing thing. Um, but I mean, I think, so for instance, like with ambient music, like the Superposition project is very much geared towards being at home, uh, being inward, listening on headphones, listening with meditation and... I think that that because we're all spending so much time at home and that really is the place that we're listening to music or listening in cars, listening on live streams, um, but which is still at home, that will subconsciously influence the, the glitch mob writing process. Although at the same time, I think the role of the artist is to envision a new world or an, and right. think about where are we going? So at this, you know, while we're with the ambient mute project, that's very much of the moment. It is my own personal process dealing with what's happening right now on, on, on every day. But as we're starting to write this new album, for me, um, at least, the process has been projecting out what, what this new world will look like when this album comes out. And there's something very... It's relieving to be able to, to lean into this hope and then create from that, from that place. Yeah, yeah. I, I know what you mean, man, because it's... It's an escape to a certain point. I always go to to the sort of escape because that's my personality. That's what music is for me. That's what most of my hobbies are. It's it's all about escapism. And that's kind of related to what you were just talking about with futurism, right? Where you're trying to sort of imagine or create even the the reality you want to live in. Yeah. And so I've been it's funny you say that because I've been the music I've been writing is actually pretty, pretty dancey and pretty ravey. And then sometimes I'm sitting there after, you know, four or five hours in front of Ableton, just like, what, a, what am I going to do with this? You know, <laughs> it's really funny. But you mentioned Superposition, which is your ambient project. And I absolutely want to talk about that. Um, was it was it started during the pandemic or I thought it had been around even before the pandemic started a little bit? Yeah, it had been around for a while. Um, Matt, who's uh, my bandmate in Superposition, is a long time, super old friend of mine. And he's been involved in glitch mob projects. He's a, an audio visual systems designer, programmer. He actually programmed the software for the Blade. And, and that was the first time we all worked together. But we had been friends for a long time. So um, we with, the, with this working relationship that we had, um, we both naturally just had this love for ambient music that we started talking about and sharing records. And so, yeah, the first record, the first Superposition album came out in 2019. And then I put out my own, my personal Beretta, med, the Meditation with Ramdas, that was in summer of 2018, right around the time that we were doing um, the last tour. So... It's been cooking for a while, and I'm I actually I've been making ambient music for a really long time just for myself. I have sessions that go way back to just experimentation, but um, just recently over the past couple of years, I've decided to start putting it out into the world. Well, and it seemed like it's going pretty well. I mean, you got the Grammy nomination. Um, what just last year, right? Yeah, that was so strange. <laughs> and also, <laughs> I I would have known now about the Grammys. I guess that was. Oh, that would, that would have been this weekend, right? Um, yeah, right. Something like that. Yeah, and they pushed them out to, to uh, March or April. To March. 
yeah. So we, we would have known now we have an extra couple of months just being nominated. But um, yeah, the whole process has been really fascinating because it's that album in particular, uh, the album's called Formless, that, that superposition was nominated for, um, is very strange, <laughs> deep music. <laughs> so of all the things that, you know, Glitch Mob's done tons of remixes and collaborations and we've put, we've put out so much music into the world that the thing that is really the, the stuff that I never, n- never once during the process that I conceive of like, this is, this is going to get the, I'm not like, this is right. art. <laughs> I am just fucking around having fun. And that is simply it. And there's something really beautiful about that process for us. It was a reminder that following those things and that, that feeling of pure play and, and joy and excitement only for the sake of that and not for anything else. Um, and that's not to downplay anything that Glitch Mob has done. It was just like this total random occurrence that this strange side project hobby thing got a nomination and really reminded me that to follow those things that really yeah. connect in that way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's so much in what you just said, man, because I think it's so easy for us especially if you've committed to a project and put a lot of time, some years into it to sort of feel like even if you want to, it would be a bad idea to shift gears or to try other things because of this this investment that you've put in, right? And all this time that's sort of, in a weird way, it starts weighing you down over time. Yeah. And yeah, I love that you you got the nomination for that, man. I think that's super inspirational. And I think that's sort of a vote for for creative freedom, right? In that there's always going to be like the glitch mob is does very well. The glitch mob is very popular, but there's always going to be new audiences and new people and different ways to connect with people if you keep following, you know, whatever it is, the passion, the curiosity, all of that. I mean, have you, I, I didn't, I listened to the superposition record and it's fantastic. I have not Thank listened you. to the other nominees because, you know, you said, oh, it's a weird project. It's weird that they would get nominated. In my head, probably all the ambient Grammy nominees are a little weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, the, so the, the other interesting thing that's happening is that I'm, um, well, it's funny how people look at the Grammy nominations and they kind of give like a thumbs up or a thumbs down. But I, th- the general sentiment is that this year they did a really good job of putting their finger on the pulse of what's happening. And it feels like a pretty good representation. Now, there's always people that are going to get snubbed. They can't of fit course. everyone in there. But at the electronic categories, I thought were great. Um, I really, I, I, they really thought about it. And so the same thing is happening in the, what is the new age category, which, uh, might transition to being the ambient category. It is a category that doesn't have a stylistic through line in the same way that electronic does. So right. you have us, which is we're making psychedelic ambient electronic music. Then you have um, John Batiste, who's who made a beautiful piano album um, with Corey Wong from Wolfpack. Then you have Laurie Anderson, who's this just uh, a dawn of experimental music. And the whole category is more like a catch-all of m- instrumental, ambient, so like vaguely ambient, potentially spiritual music. Um, yeah, it's more like a shared uh, mindset or perspective, right? Yes, it's more of a perspective or like a, an, an intention. Although if you listen to those five albums, you, I, you're like, there's, there's absolutely nothing that links them all together <laughs> in, <laughs> musically, which I think is really cool. Um, and it, it's I mean, one of my favorite artists of all time in the ambient world is Brian Eno, and he's, he's been nominated as well. So it's really an honor to get to be involved in this process. And also... Um, through this whole superposition project and releasing ambient music, I've met so many younger artists and there's, there's a really cool ambient scene in LA. Um, leaving records has Matthew David has been putting out records here for a long time under like kind of related to brain feeder and everything flying. Right. Lotus has been doing and, and it's, it's, it's just exciting to see this whole thing changing because in in the world of music, people can get stuck and fixed on categories having to define the music. But um, this th- them taking a chance on us like this feels like a uh, 
a step of having a, a little bit more of an open mind because it doesn't sound like any of the <laughs> the albums that have been there before. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. It'd be really, really fun. I want you to win the Grammy, but and it would also be really, really funny if you beat Brian Eno for a Grammy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, he's not in this. He's not in the category this year. He was in, oh, the, okay. in the years past. Oh, prior, prior. Okay, yes. fair enough. Well, it's could, probably better <laughs> that you're not matched up. <laughs> that would have been that would have been really funny if that would have happened, though. Yeah. <laughs> but talking about you know finding sort of this this ambient scene in LA and being exposed to this new group of creatives. That's got to be cool and refreshing for you too to sort of put yourself back in the place of being a kid and being, you know, just starting out, just meeting everybody, just sort of surveying the sea. And does it does it feel like that to you? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the 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 um the biggest things that I've learned from this whole process, it does come around to the sense of beginner's mind and feeling like this music, these people, the way that the music all is released, all of it, it, it feels new to me. And there's something really valuable in that for creativity in that um, it, I don't feel like I have completely colored in my easel. It, feel, it feels like an open palette. Mm. And, um, and you can actually, that, that feeling and that sensation has moved laterally to other projects as well. Because even though, for instance, like Glitch Mob has a sound, has a catalog of music, and there's an expectation for what it sounds like, that can be limiting, but it can also be um, really liberating to look at that and throw it out and just, and just, just start over again in new ways and see something differently. So I think for me, it is a feeling of getting outside of the system of looking at this box of creativity that I've been working in and then coming at it from a different angle. And then all of a sudden, just being able to have fun again, being like, I don't actually have any idea what I'm doing. I'm just making sounds. Yeah. Great. That's the best. That really is the best feeling. I, and yeah, I've been trying to put myself in that mode. It's funny you say that because I've been thinking about that a lot lately. I think that's one of the best things anyone who does anything creative can do is try to basically just try to make yourself forget all the shit you already know. <laughs> exactly, yes. <laughs> as counterintuitive as just that like, sounds. It's true, right? It's like you you learn all these frameworks, you study, you have experience, and then when you actually sit down, you have to just let it go and see what comes out and and, and not follow those things that, um, that predefine what it's going to be because the best the best music happens, the best creation happens, I believe, when it comes from an authentic place. Right, 100%. If you can point to anything specific, it's okay if you can't, but you know, you were talking about being exposed to this new ambient scene and seeing the way they did it, the way they were releasing music, the way they were communicating with each other. So whether it's anything like that or even something compositionally when you're putting together tracks for Superposition, has working in the ambient scene given you anything that you've been able to take and apply to other projects, you know, talking about these new perspectives. Is there anything more specifically you can point to? Yeah, there's, there's a lot there. Um, one of the most liberating things is creating music without a grid or tempo. <clears throat> like when we're writing, there's no click, there's no drums, there's, there's no tempo. Sometimes we'll, st we'll start creating and we'll have no idea like what tempo we're working in. But the interesting thing is that coming back, we'll be able to find a tempo in there. But really, it's just coloring <laughs> on a on a page and and going completely um, by intuition and following the intuition more than following structure and rules. So, what does it look like if you're if you and Matt are putting together a track for a superposition, you know, and and you're starting with a blank page? Do you guys have any kind of process? Like, how would a how would a track for superposition start? Um. Yeah, there's a process that's emerged over time, although it wasn't always w with us. Um, but we we have a bunch of instruments that we've made, right? So there's predetermined. I have sets of stacks of uh, soft synths and EQs and these crazy patches that I've made where you just play one note and it like it makes this whole world of sound and plays out. Um, and so the whole thing is very. It's very quick, right? Where like I don't spend a lot of time designing patches in the moment because I have this this kit 
of uh, pre pre made right. patches and instruments. So we could we we basically just start playing and follow what sounds good, and everything moves really really quickly. And because you don't have a traditional song structure that you're trying to make someone remember something in particular, this it can move, and it's more about forms and shapes than it is about individual little pieces. So we'll think of an arc of something more like a wave. And in that way, it's more influenced by, by nature. There's waves, there's a lot of space in there too. And sometimes it's actually just about creating space for you to float around in that feels more like uh, your mind, <laughs> that like consciousness yeah. where you, it doesn't always have to be telling a story the whole time. You know, it's like, especially with, with Glitch Mob, it's polar opposite where every song is telling a story it's a story that has an, emo- an emotion attached to it. There's a directionality and a force of that emotion. This one is maybe it's a little bit melancholy and it's epic and we are taking you through this. And then there's so much detail put into because there's no vocals, but we treat the synths in, in the glitch mob like vocals, like everything has a character to it. And this is the opposite where um, the type of ambient music that we like to make really isn't super suggestive. It's more like a place that you can go and there's layers in there. There's a tons and tons of detail, but um, it doesn't really graft a, a, a super serious emotion onto it because the thing with ambient, when there's, there's no drums, I mean, sometimes there's a little bit of percussion sure. in rhythm, but it's not, it, but most of the stuff doesn't have traditional kick snare if you start to put in string arrangements that are really intense it starts to sound like a movie soundtrack right Right. it's like so it's really about letting people make up their own mind and really playing with negative space a lot because a lot of people use it for meditation or um calming themselves so it's it it does have a purpose sure Um, it doesn't have to also. I mean, you can obviously... Music is so personal. I mean, I've learned that one person can listen to an album and think that it's sad. The other person is going to think that it's happy. But oh the, yeah, the goal with this one is not really to grab someone by the lapel and take them on down this, this tunnel. <laughs> well, I mean, I think the use. worst thing any artist can do is try to tell people the right way to consume their work, right? Yes. <laughs> yes, that, that is... Yeah, there's something about that that feels like very very disrespectful. And um, that, that has been also another really beautiful part of this whole process is just hearing from people and how they've consumed this music. Um, I was on a, a podcast a, a month ago where a guy was saying that one of these meditation pieces we had made was very comforting to him and he had to go into surgery and, uh, and he, had, he had Crohn's disease and he was coming out of surgery and listening to this thing over and over and over again on repeat, almost like it was a, a, a medicine. And I think the cool thing is that any music can do this. It doesn't have yeah. to have this healing intention, but um, there is something there that you connect with people in a different way when there is more of like a, a, a stated um, intention for it. Yeah, I think intention is absolutely the key word, right? Because if you if you write something with intention... I think that gives it the the strongest chance of translating to anybody who's listening to it, right? And that's the only thing that people are going to connect with at the end of the day is, you know, that authentic feeling that, that's it. you know, hopefully if we're doing our best work is going to come through in what we make. I, and you mentioned, you know, that you've also, uh, in in the Superposition Project, I mean, you've done these sort of I don't know what to call them, but you've worked with meditations from, uh, you know, people like Ramdas or Alan Watts. And I, I, well, maybe for, for the podcast, we should just say, who are these people? First of all, what is your relationship to them? And then what is sort of the process of working with, you know, their, their meditations, their vocals? Cause it's gotta be super different than just working on a song with somebody. It's way different than <laughs> working on a normal <laughs> song with vocals in the future. Um, yeah, so the way I started doing these meditations was, I mean, I, zooming out a little bit, I've, I've been into meditation for a while now on my, in my own. I started with transcendental meditation, which is one method. Um, and I've been to meditation retreats, silent retreats, using Vipassana style meditation. And it's something that really transformed my, my life. I found to be super valuable just in general as, as a, as a tool. And how long ago did you get into meditation? 
it's it's been a, about ten years now for me. Um, I have a friend that that got me into TM, and um, it's yeah, it's just been with me ever since. Not every single day, but I would say most days, aside from crazy travel days over the past decade, I've been meditating. And um, when I discovered Ram Dass's work, it was after having some really impactful psychedelic experiences where I. It was a combination of meditation for me and a lot of preparation and uh, the, using them through a therapeutic lens. So this was not recreation, just like out in the out in the world. But I had a series of very powerful experiences that really changed things for me in my own personal landscape. And then I discovered Ramdas, and it it just it was the perfect marriage of ideas and um, and what was happening to me at the time. Um, and I mean, who is, for people who don't know, who is Ram Das? Yeah, Ram Das, um, he, who passed away relatively recently, is a teacher who started off in, in the West. And he was part of the original of the Harvard psilocybin experiment in the 60s, who was kicked out. Then he, to make a long story short, he went to India and started meditating and then came back to the West and brought these in the middle of the whole hippie culture thing. He brought these ideas back and he became a really incredible teacher where he channeled a lot of his, uh, uh, well, let's say he channeled, but he, he repackaged them for the Western audience. And so at the time there wasn't a, a much talk of meditation in the West. So he, he brought them back. Same thing with Alan Watts. Alan Watts was, was a little bit before him, but he was a teacher that traveled to Japan and studied with Zen teachers. And then, um, repackaged and translated a lot of this stuff from Eastern philosophy into the West. So for me, when I, when I started really going deep into all this work, I wanted to find a way to contribute in some way. And I found these, uh, these meditations and this audio through looking on YouTube because there's a, t- there's a whole world of people who take Alan Watts talks, meditations, and put music on them. But um, I didn't find anything exactly like I wanted to hear. So I just started creating these things. And I think of, um, you know, meditation with music, the music, you know, it's like when you have to give a dog a pill and you put in peanut butter. (laughs) (laughs) That's a great analogy. The music really just helps it all, helps it slide down. And then at the same time, I wanted to help create rabbit holes from our world of electronic music back down to these teachings which have been really um, super useful for me. And there's nothing to believe about them. There's nothing religious. It's really it, it just ways of um, observing what it's like to be a human. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Just different ways of kind of thinking about how you go about your life, right? Yeah, that's how it. How you act in the world, how you interact with people. And what was it like, you know, to working with these teachings and these recordings that obviously mean a lot to you and mean a lot to a lot of people. Was there, was it nerve wracking a bit to try to put something out using, you know, these, these old, these decades old from, you know, these famous teachers, um, and, and thinkers, did you feel a certain pressure to, to do them justice? Um, you know, I, I didn't really, feel pressure. I think that um, when I was making these things and we create these meditations, the whole process is very meditative for us. So I'll go into, I feel like I have to create from that headspace because it's so easy. It's a constant, I mean, just in general life, especially creativity is a constant feedback loop between overthinking and then like coming back to the moment, right? It's yes. so easy to, to overthink things and and then get lost in our um, ego constructions of what this thing is going to be and what it needs to be and what it should be. And then the irony is if I would get lost in the overthinking while listening to these teachings, for me, it was always like, okay, I'm just going to come back and make something that, um, that really just, I'm, it's like ornamentation, right? Where I wasn't really trying to do too much to them. Um, but I, I did know that I wanted to, just like I was talking about the ambient music in general, create a space for people to listen and experience these, these, the teachings in a way with the music, it's almost this, this soothing mechanism. Um, but it really wasn't meant to make up your mind about what they're really 
what they're really saying there. This, they're almost just like the vocals come in, they unhook you from your problems for a moment. And then the music is there to keep it washing. Right, right. Yeah. And you can take from it whatever you take from it. I, yeah. I like that. And it's uh, it's interesting, you know, you mentioned these psychedelic experiences also sort of coming hand in hand with discovering meditation and these teachers and all that. And I remember uh, when you and uh, the rest of the Glitch Mob were on the podcast the last time, you had mentioned some early psychedelic experiences that sort of opened your eyes to the possibilities of, you know, altered experiences in, combined with music and and all of that. And so am I right in saying that sort of you've had this relationship with psychedelics for a large part of your life that is now you're sort of honing in on and looking at a little more clinically and a little more therapeutically? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I've, I started taking psychedelics at a very young age and messing around and, and definitely in college was doing all sorts of crazy shit, which I, de I would not recommend for anyone because I'm really spe <laughs> speaking <laughs> from at, at this point, I've come back around to the therapy. When I say the therapeutic use, meaning more like with a safe intention with a guide and um, using them for the lens of healing and for health. Yeah. Not necessarily for partying. Um, well, right. And you're not alone <laughs> in that lens, right? I mean, I think just if you look at the recent legislation in lots of different parts of the country, I mean, I'm in D.C. where mushrooms just got decriminalized, you know, this last election cycle. Yeah, that's insane. Um, yeah, it, it's really wild, man. So, I mean, there's definitely, uh, there's there's a moment happening for it. Yes, there's there's a moment happening. And um, there's also this looming mental health crisis. You know, suicide rates have gone up recently with the pandemic. And these tools, these, these medicines can be very helpful um, in this. I mean, I've, so I've, through this whole process, I've spent a lot of time talking with psychedelic therapists. I've spoken with policymakers and scientists and just just really gone in head first to try to understand and to see how I could help out because they've helped me so much. I I'm completely dedicated to do whatever I can to help get these out there and also help to relay um safe use guidelines, uh, suggestions to to deal with harm reduction. I mean I think it's also been great to have a break from the festival season so we can all yeah. see this is this is all happening during a time where there are no festivals and um when they start back up again um i'm going to do everything i can to get information out there there's a lot of really great organizations that are doing this as well but you know like i've, I've been talking to people at dance safe for doing some really cool stuff as you know dance and Safe is great yeah they're they're great but yeah especially around um i would say that like my focus is less around festival worlds um, in general and more on using them as tools for for health, mental health, for it can help with depression or anxiety, um, all well, sorts yeah. of ailments. Yeah. I mean, if as much as you'd care to share, you know, you, you've said that they really helped you and you found the, their use to be therapeutic. Uh, I mean, how did they help you? You know, what what has your personal experience been with psychedelics? Yeah, I mean, um, through through once I finally came around through the um, the experiences of recreation, which which again, like I just have to say that I I don't recommend. Meaning that, like, just taking yeah. them and seeing what happens, um, it, it, it it's really super dangerous to do that. Um, well, sure. I mean, and if we're talking about medicine, which, you know, this is, I think, what the country is coming around to, that these can be medicines, it then think about it like that. You wouldn't just take a random medicine <laughs> to see what happens, right? Yeah, like, let's just go see what happens. I'm just yeah. going to go... <laughs> what if wander? I pop this blood pressure medication? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just like wandering around Burning Man on blood pressure meds. Um, for me, it was really the combination of meditation and the the therapeutic use of psychedelics that have opened up my sense of of gratitude, and I feel more in my skin. I feel like I can um, I can reach back, and this is not something I do all the time. Um, I've had and you know a handful of these really powerful experiences that I can recall and and draw from, and you know. The, at uh, Johns Hopkins, which is near you, 
they use them for end of life anxiety for people that have terminal uh, cancer, right. any sort of terminal illness. And there's a reason why when you have this experience, you feel this overwhelming sense of gratitude to be alive, this sense of everything's okay. And when you have that, um, when I had that, when I'm uh, not dealing with any particular ailment, um, you know, and it, it was, has just been really completely transformative to have a break from being Justin and uh, at these, at the, under the high dose experiences of psilocybin mushrooms, you, your personality goes offline and I have a chance to just be without all of my personality and my wants and desires and hopes and fears of psychedelics have a way of completely just opening up the floodgates of your mind and perception. And when you do that in a controlled space, it can be really super transformative. Um, in, in, in Michael Pollan's book, How to Change Your Mind, which is an incredible primer in all of this, he talks about, he uses this phrase, um, the betterment of well people, referring to that it's just as important for people who want to explore their consciousness, who may not have anything that they're particularly trying to heal. Like, it's, it's just as important as people that have, um, have terminal cancer or PTSD, um, which I, I, I think that it's, it's, it is incredible though, that people, especially for military veterans that have been using, um, MDMA with, with PTSD treatment and having really, really fantastic results. There's so much cool research happening right now. So I, MDMA will be the first one to become legalized and then mushrooms next. So I have been doing this sort of in the, in the background for a long time, but during this whole moment, the combination of the ambient music and the, the meditation and the moment and the pandemic has, I've really been like, okay, I need to talk about this stuff in public and create some, um, some music to help create awareness for all these cool things. Yeah. Well, and it's, it's interesting too. I, I tell me if I'm right about this, but I would imagine years ago, there's probably a little more anxiety about talking oh, yeah. about this stuff in public, right? Because for any of this, for even true believers for years and years, it's, it's been so unaccepted on the mainstream level that I think, you know, if, if you were to make that your defining cause I think it's pretty easy for people to sort of, you know, shove you off into a corner somewhere. Yes, exactly. That no, that's that's completely right. You 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 become a that's a drugs person, but it's so funny because um yeah, now there's a moment where shows like 60 minutes have been covering these and there's very serious research happening at Johns Hopkins and si Western science is starting to come around to understand things that other indigenous cultures in Mexico and South America and even uh, ancient Greece have, um, not the ancient Greece is an indigenous culture, but just the right. quick tangent, this book, The old Immortality Key. Yeah. Yes, Old Cultures. Immortality Key is an incredible book about how there was psychedelic sacrament used in the formation of democracy in ancient Greece. And I highly recommend it. But these have all been around for a very long time. And in fact, we've, we have, it's only the past, you know, 100, 200 years that we haven't been using them in culture. So this is a very beautiful moment to be able to talk about this stuff publicly and safely. Yeah, it's amazing, man. I mean, maybe to put the period on the end of this sentence about advocacy that we've been going down, uh, how would you advise? I mean, how about this? Give me some advice because I am somebody who's interested in all of this, but I haven't uh, really had many of these kind of experiences What's the best way other than, you know, the, the books that you've named, you know, how should people start looking into this? How should people think about incorporating this into their life if it's something that sounds interesting to them? It's a really interesting time because we're at this transition point where psychedelics are going from being uh, taboo and illegal and almost like they were treated completely like a death sentence into something that people are now changing their, their minds about. And along with this is going to come framework yeah. and best practice and center. So for instance, like in Oregon, um, psychedelic therapy passed on the, on the ballot, meaning that in the next couple of years, you will be able to, to go to Oregon and legally 
go have psilocybin mushroom therapy with a licensed and trained guide. And, and I think having, having training like that and to become a guide is really super important. So in the same way that if, like, if you want to go to a meditation retreat, you can just go out. There's one in, the, in, in every forest right. in almost every <laughs> state and just go and have this experience. Um, it'll be something probably closer to that than necessarily going to see a psychotherapist, but this, this will be incorporated into Western psychotherapy. So I, I, I would, especially if you haven't had experiences like this before, I would recommend just hanging on a little bit longer because yeah. <laughs> soon this, there's going to be an incredible place where you'll be able to go and, and, and be with some of the, you know, the best uh, guides and teachers and thinkers in the world and have this experience in a way that is completely safe. Well, sure. I mean, just look at how quickly the weed industry, you know, sort of professionalized itself once it started becoming legal in you know, all the States, yeah, it's, just a couple of years ago, that was still super, yes. super underground. And now, you know, I mean, yeah, it's it's a full on commercialized uh, product with science behind it and everyone making different strides. It's really the transformation happens so quickly. Yes. And I mean, the same thing will happen with, with psychedelics, although, I mean, there's a lot of... There's a lot of stuff that happened in the cannabis industry that I don't want to see happen. Of course. And, and that is that... Um, I mean, cannabis is different. I mean, you can, you can kind of lump it in with psychedelics, but weed is really, it's its own thing. But in, in the psychedelic world, a lot of people look to the intersection of uh, sort of like startup capitalism and cannabis as a, as a, a, a cautionary tale of we actually yeah. don't want this to happen because these medicines are very, very powerful. And actually cannabis is too. That's not, just, I mean, I've, some of that, craziest experiences I've ever had was eating too much, eating a, a weed brownie and being like, where am I? What time right, is it? Right. <laughs> but, um, I, I do believe that these should all be completely legal, but, um, I do not think it should be like weed where you can just walk down to the store and buy this stuff and, and go see what happens that it should be regulated and there should be people who know what they're doing involved in yeah. the committee that designs a way that people can have this stuff safely because in the 60s um this all went off the rails when lsd was legal and it became this this huge movement and there's a lot of really irresponsible things happening not even just from people but the government as well and it just and we just lost this whole um this whole moment and the the, the deep healing potential of this so i i i look forward to the um there's a lot of really thoughtful people who've been working on this for a long time. And um, I do believe that in the next couple of years, like well, I'll have a podcast with you a year from now and we're going to be like, so how, <laughs> really, how was your, right. how's your trip to Oregon? How was your mystical experience? <laughs> Amen, man. Yeah. I'm, I'm super down for that. And it's funny hearing <laughs> you talk about, you know, the the concerns of that community as this becomes more accepted and more mainstream because to to draw a line back to the music scene it's almost like hearing somebody talk about underground versus mainstream it's almost like hearing somebody talk about oh you know this music what went pop and it's you know it's yeah. corny and it's commercialized now and, and it's it's almost the exact same thing in a way because especially in America, I think once something gets attention like that, like let's take the EDM phenomenon, you know, it blew up, which was great for all of us who are passionate about this music, lots more opportunities, but then, you know, America and capitalism does what it does. It does its thing. It does its thing. <laughs> it, <laughs> it goes burr. And uh, then we kind of get, what EDM has. I, I just remembered this. It's on my sheet. I saw a quote from you. Um, I don't know when some interview you did in the last 10 years, but you were talking about the difference in your mind between electronic music and EDM, quote unquote. And you said something, I'm paraphrasing, but something basically like to you, electronic music, that's, that's just music. That's a kind of music. And when you hear EDM, what you think about is music plus business 
plus <laughs> all these other traffic, right. you know, plus bookings and stages and all these things that don't have so much to do with music. I thought that was a really interesting take. Industry, yes, it has it all, all baked in there. Although, you know, I, I, I do stand by that quote. But interestingly now, I've met a lot of younger producers who just call everything EDM and it doesn't yeah. feel... I, I, I remember saying that and thinking like, because we never, I never would have said, oh yeah, I'm an EDM producer. But um, I, yeah, I, I, I think that the word has just become deloaded and, <laughs> and yeah. Um, oh, it's changed. I mean, words, the meanings change of words over time all right. the time. It's funny because I just talked to somebody uh, on the show a couple weeks ago who's more on the business side of the industry. And the way he talked about sort of the EDM explosion was it, it was very businessy, but he was like, no, like dance music just kind of needed a new brand. It needed a new presentation in order to reach a new audience. And so he looked at it very cut and dry. But after I thought about it, I was like, actually, that kind of makes sense that if people had preconceived notions about dance music, you weren't going to convince them just by telling them more about it. But if it's presented as kind of a new thing, then maybe, yeah, it does draw in this new audience with all the benefits and drawbacks that that has. Absolutely. Yeah. And and it's funny too, the way that language evolves with culture and ideas. And I think, especially when that term was was first thrown around, I think what I what I was feeling from the from the artist side of things was that EDM was more of like a uh, a marketing tool than than it was a way of making music. Um, however, right now I feel a little bit differently, and I think that um, whatever is going to get more people making music, whatever is going to get more people to the shows and uh, enjoying and appreciating and becoming part of this of this thing the better then that's yeah. that's pretty much it oh a hundred percent man i mean the last time i saw you in person i we've talked on the phone a few times since then but the last time i saw you in person was when i randomly r was walking around baltimore and ran <laughs> into right. your tour bus <laughs> just completely randomly like literally walked into your tour bus uh, while you were on tour with Slander or yeah, Slander and Nightmare and Seven Lions. That's right. On that big sort of like, I don't know what you call it, that big theater, like stadium kind of yeah, tour <laughs> that right. you guys were doing, which is a very EDM tour and probably a bit of a fish out of water thing for you guys. I, what, what was it like sort of taking part in a full on like big top EDM show like that? <laughs> <laughs> it was, com it was the, the most EDM thing. Um, it was awesome. Those, all of those artists are just the sweetest, best people. Yeah, we had, we nice had so team. much, so much fun. It was just like the, the nice people tour. We had three different buses and we would go and like play paintball together. And, um, yeah. Jeff Seven Lions is super adventurous and he would like his crew would always plan these crazy adventures around. And so it was, it was really honestly so fun to get outside of our zone um, and, and play those, those shows. And I think also for the most part um, in the world of bass music, people, I think people have gotten more tolerant and open-minded. You know, you have, even though that the music that we're playing is very different from both Seven Lions and Slander when Glitch Mob was on stage, um, people were people were just happy to hear something, and a lot of our fans would come. And you could, there's the mishmash of fans, but um, they just wanted an, an energy and a feeling, and and it was really fun to be to be out there just doing our thing and realizing that um, people. People were there for the energy, you know. It was it wasn't necessarily like they just had to hear that one song. It was like these little mini festivals <laughs> that yeah. that that would happen around. I love oh, man. I loved that bill. I loved running into you guys and watching a little bit of the show because it really did remind me of the way festivals used to be when I was younger and I was coming up. Where you would go, you know, if you think even about sort of the origins of Lollapalooza in the nineties. You know, those bills, those bills were wild, the kinds yes. of acts and sounds they would throw together. And it was great to see that in dance music, because that's 
maybe one of my biggest bummers about how electronic music has blown up in the last several years, five, 10 years, whatever it is, is, you know, this sort of the walling off between genres and people. And, you know, you go see some big name tour and it's four openers who sound exactly like the headliner. And uh, to me, there's nothing more boring than that, both as <laughs> both as a performer and a listener, honestly. Yeah, exactly. And 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 we had a lot of talks about this out on tour, and that's that's the exact thing where they're used in the rock world. People do this a lot. You know, there's there's big tours where you have acts that are super, you know, absolutely, completely different, um, or they take a bunch of big bands and put them together in order to create this whole experience where they're not really pigeonholing the sound into like one type of cuisine, right? right? It's like you have all these different types of cuisines and they, I feel like it, the idea is that it trusts the listener and it trusts the music fan to have their own experience and weave something completely different and it trusts the, the music. So it was, just, it was an incredible experience and, and everyone, I mean, I, I, I really, we were all, we all became very fond of each other, <laughs> especially when I was just like, remember the first time I met Nightmare, I was like, his name is Nightmare. He's like the the nicest person in the entire world. Like, he's I'm, so sweet. I am yeah. motherfucking Nightmare. Like, <laughs> best. <laughs> yeah, no, he's the sweetest person. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> That's so funny, man. <laughs> yes, but it was it, it was uh, a fun a fun experience. I mean, it sounds crazy to be together with a group of like fifty people and various buzzes traveling around right now. But I I do look forward to the to the day when something like that will be able to happen again because that was right before I was like, that was the end of 2019. We wrapped up in October. So that was final months uh, yeah. pre-pandemic. Yeah. You got in just under the wire. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. I, I hope that comes back soon as well. I mean, cause you guys were playing to big crowds too. Like these are, these were what amphitheaters kind of, right? Yeah. They were big crowds because, and because of all of the, um, the fan bases of each artist mixed together, we were playing really big venues. So it was really like playing festivals. I mean, playing the, uh, the gorge in, in Washington was, that was one of the craziest moments. I mean, you, you've been there, like it's, yeah. it's absolutely insane, stunningly gorgeous. And it, it felt like we were playing, playing a festival there. And also for us, um, you know, glitch mob always has this big, crazy production. And we decided to do CDJs and we brought some modular gear to right. sync with them and, and, and do intros and outros and some other affecting stuff. But it was the first time where we thought, okay, let's, let's just do what everyone else is doing and set up on CDJs, play DJ set and have fun. And it was actually really fun. We're like, oh man, this is, this is great. We had, this is we what had, everybody <laughs> else gets to do. Yeah. <laughs> Wait a second. <laughs> you, you don't have to haul out a hundred thousand tons of, <laughs> gear and wires and drums and everything. Um, but no, it was, it was really fun. And, um, slander has this, this stage production that they let us use as well. So in the beginning of the, of the night, we, it would transform and move around depending on who was playing. So everything was shared. And, and again, like this stuff just doesn't happen that much. Yeah. Th- mm-hmm. I want to, I want to stop on that for a second. Cause that's a really important point is that you guys were all sharing the production and sharing the full stage, which I don't know if the average listener understands why that is a big deal. But, you know, in these tours, most of the time, the headliner comes out with a giant uh, EDM for lack of a better word, stage production but yes. anyone playing before them is basically just sort of playing in front of a, a blank sheet, you know? Yes. And, and that's another part of the bummer of it all to me is that that, again, just never seems like a fun way for the performers or for the listeners. Yeah, exactly. And it, there, there's a sense of creating a, an arc throughout the night where the show becomes more and more fantastical. And with this, we just turn it up right from the very beginning and we shared this this massive stage production that we that was designed to to reconfigure depending on which artist was in it and it was it was a big deal because um there was a a sense that every act was getting was getting their own show um at least as far as the uh the headliners we had some actually so yeah, sudden death was on with us and huxley ann um and 
Yeah, I it's, it's I actually haven't talked about this in so long. It's crazy thinking back to what that was really like. There were so many people on that on that tour. It was yeah. it was a super super inspiring moment. I mean, sudden death, another one with a uh, you know ridiculous name who ends up being the <laughs> nicest person in the world. Yes, totally. <laughs> yeah, I, I had him on this show, and uh, he was talking, and the whole interview was about obviously you know the sudden death project and his inspirations, and you know he kept talking about you know it's. It's I'm channeling this anger and, you know, it's like this really aggressive music. And I think at one point I just said, I was like, you don't seem very angry. Yeah. I was like, where, where is this coming from? <laughs> yes, totally. You know, he's, he's such a nice guy. And, and that's the cool thing about music is that you can express a part of yourself that may never sh- see the light of day in, 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 uh, in any other way. And it's, and, and I mean, I, I feel that with my own music as well. I mean, a lot of Glitch Mob's music gets gets really intense. Or I mean, you meet people like that a lot, where you're you're out there and you're like, wait, same thing. Like, wait, you're you're a nightmare. Your music's really aggressive. He's like, hey, man. And it's yeah. this, it, I don't know. I think that like that's the the beauty of this whole process is we are complex creatures. You don't have to just be one thing. You can be angry or you can be super peaceful and express different things through this. Right. And um, I I. I get excited about people that push boundaries and and make people think about constructs and and um, musical limitations in different ways because there really is, there really are no rules and there shouldn't be you shouldn't think that there are that there are rules or gates to doing doing any of oh, this. Oh, hundred percent. And all of the people we talk about, almost a hundred percent of the people we end up talking about are only the people who break the rules, right? Exactly. I yes. mean, very, it's very rare that we end up talking for five, 10 minutes, praising somebody who followed all the rules. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know what I wanted to ask you about um, is we talked about the first time you were on the show with Glitch Mob that You've also been just a a tech and a computer nerd since a young age. And uh, I know you do or you're involved with the the Hyperspective app, which is, uh, you know, making these sort of kind of wild, trippy visual filters uh, that people can use. And I know you've also had some experience with uh, VR and new methods for virtual reality, building spaces in there. Have you been active with any of that kind of stuff in this pandemic year when people are looking at new ways to connect with each other? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Hyperspective, yeah, it's an iOS app for making glitch art, basically super crazy video and photo effects. And we we took the the guts of Hyperspective and we put it into another a new app called Hyperstream that's meant for live streaming. So it plugs into um, a streaming setup like OBS. Um, if you're familiar, that's sort of like the open source oh, yeah. streaming software. I think a lot more people are familiar <laughs> with OBS than I they know. used to be. Yeah. Everyone's like, I know a year ago, people would have been like, Oh, me what? But, oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> now everyone has OBS. Um, so yeah, you can take, you can take your iPhone and plug it into OBS and get a bunch of these really crazy AR effects and everything. And the idea was to make effects cheap and easy to use. I mean, the app, I think right now it's like 10 bucks or something. And when I first started streaming, um, I was blown away with how hard it was to just get effects onto my stream. It's like, right. are you, gonna, you have to have someone else with another computer and you have Resolume or whatever other suite it's crazy of video software. Yeah. It's really complicated. So yeah, HyperStream is a, it's a, Super easy way just to get some cool effects onto your live streams. That's great, man. Yeah, it's it's interesting. Are you um, are you doing anything? Or are you looking at anything in virtual reality right now? It's been on my mind because I just talked to somebody who's really excited about building virtual spaces and doing performances there. Even you know, past the pandemic, he he was really gung ho about it. Oh yeah, there's so much crazy stuff happening in the world of uh of vr and 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 xr right now for mixed reality i've seen so many cool things and also like glitch mob did a, a show with the wave in 2018 and they've they've taken everything to uh, such a crazy point um i think yeah, I that mean, the wave new- was early on the virtual reality shows they were super early on that and, i mean i think that the next couple of years are going to be super interesting i also got 
an Oculus uh, Quest, which I think is the best VR headset that has ever existed. And it's cheaper. So the price is coming down. Um, have you tried using a Quest before? I've never, no, I've done VR, but never with the Quest. I I was excited about it. And then I was talking to friends and again, this is all secondhand, but they were saying that, you know, they, since Oculus got acquired by Facebook, that there were some maybe not so great things happening with like yeah. data protection and all that. But no, I, I'd love to try it. It's really cool. I mean, I think the the big picture takeaway with all this stuff is that the technology is getting really good and I'm, I, I've been uh, helping out behind the scenes with a, a number of different projects of, of stuff that will come out in 2021 that's going to be really exciting. There's always rumors of Apple dropping some kind of AR headset too. And yeah. As soon as they do something, everything will change. I mean, it's the same thing with um, even if you just think about AirPods, right? It was like everyone used to wear those like Bluetooth headsets on that one side, just this right. kind of like goofy <laughs> thing. But all of a sudden, Apple makes something. Finally, they make AirPods, and everyone ha- everyone has these things now, and they're they're sexy. They work really well for the most part. When they do something with VR, everything will change, and I think it will become a ubiquitous technology that we'll all have uh, in our house. It's not quite there yet, so there's yeah. a lot of really exciting stuff being built. I think the I feel like right now. The uh, the groundwork is being built, although people have been working on this since the '70s, so it's not like this is a new thing. But it's really it's all just coming to to a head right now. And I think even beyond just VR, that the next um, the way that shows will work over the next year, a couple of years, will be a hybrid of of all of these things. Like I don't think live streaming is just gonna stop once we can right. go to concerts again. I do think that people are sick of looking at screens. But there will be some hybrid version of this where um, live streams and shows will all be mashed together into some new new reality and VR will be a part of that in some level. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right, man. It's going to be so interesting to see what the sort of ripple effects of this weird year are on our little community. I mean, as we're wrapping it up here, where's your head at with all of this? You know, you're working on a new Glitch Mob album. You're nominated for a Grammy with Superposition. We're talking about all these new technologies. What do you find yourself thinking about the most? What do you find yourself excited about the most, spending the most time on right now? Um, So one of the most fun projects, aside from writing a new Glitch Mob record, which we're just getting going, which is always one of my most favorite, beloved processes, um, Superposition is starting a label called Formless. So... That'll be a place to host all of our meditations. Um, we have a meditation we've we've created with uh, Eckhart Tolle that's coming out in 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 March, and a bunch of other cool collaborations. There's a ton of collaborations happening there, and I've met. Uh, it's been really exciting to meet younger artists and other people in the community to collaborate with. So um, that that to me, both sides of my head, right? I have the right the crazy glitch mob dance world and the crazy weird psychedelic ambient music. Those are um, my main two points of focus right now. And just staying grateful, meditating, being balanced and um, enjoying it, having fun while doing it. Are you, are you envisioning when shows eventually do come back, whenever that is, do you think, are you talking about superposition live shows, whatever that would look like or live meditations? Absolutely. We, we've played a couple shows. We did uh, almost more like a sound bath type experience um, where people are lying down. We, we did one at Lightning in a Bottle Festival, uh, whichever the last one was, which was super fun. So whenever those do come back, we will have some form of a live show, though it won't be like at a, at a normal concert venue. Um, you know, there's like a, a church here in Los Angeles where they do ambient shows so it'll be something like that and we've had some some conversations but i think that we're we'll wait until everything is just right and super safe to be able to go and do those yeah of course man well it'll be it'll be interesting to see what you do with it just you know based off of how well thought out the glitch mob shows are i would be very interested to see what a what a superposition performance of any type looks like 
Oh, thanks. It should be, yeah, it, it, it will be fun. We'll, we'll cook up something super psychedelic. <laughs> I look forward to that, man. <laughs> well, this has been great, man. It's great to catch up with you every time we get to talk, man. I, I just feel better. So thank you for taking the time. Yes. Thanks so much. Um, that was really good, man. All right. Perfect, man. Take care. Take care, Willie. Bye-bye. Right, that's the show shout out to beretta great to have you back on man great to connect once more for everybody out there listening i hope you enjoyed that as much as i did don't forget beretta's got a lot going on his group superposition they are grammy nominated for their album formless they've got a new meditation album coming out very soon if you're a streamer you got to check out justin's hyperstream app and if you like me are a fan of the glitch mob uh stay tuned because they are working on something there's a link in the description of this episode where you can go follow justin keep up to date with everything he's doing another one where you can follow me and join the back-to-back discord come join the discord come hop in say what up to me i will say what up back and then we will be best friends forever that's how it works if discord is a little too much for you you can always just hit me on social media at willie joy at back to back pod or you can email me back to back pod at gmail.com is the email address so that's it for this week i love talking to justin man always makes me smile always makes me feel good to hear from him i hope he did the same for you. I hope, uh, yeah, I hope you got something to smile about this week. Doesn't have to be a big thing. Could be a little thing. I hope you're finding ways to connect with the people you love and ways to work on the things you're trying to accomplish. Even if those things are just, uh, you know, relaxing, taking a break. Sometimes you even got to work on that. So I guess that's the thought I'm going to leave you with this week. Just be kind to yourself. Celebrate those little victories. Enjoy those little moments. Take care. Be safe. And I will talk to you next Tuesday. Love you guys. For Back to Back, this is Willie Joy. Peace. (laughs) 